All right, welcome back. Today we're going to jump into looking at change detection between two point clouds in Cloud Compare. And there's a lot of different ways to do this uh, within Cloud Compare, but also potentially outside of Cloud Compare in GIS software like QGIS or ArcMap. And so I'm going to go through and explain how point cloud differencing is a little bit different than a traditional kind of raster based change detection first. So the data that I've got up here is from our Sandy River data set that we've looked at in uh, some past tutorials. And this is just the, the north edge of that data set right along the river where the dam removal happened. Um, and so I've pulled out two small little cross sections down here. So we'll look at these real quick. And so the data I've got here are from 2008, which is uh, this data set, and then 2011, which is this data set. And so if I put both of those on uh, top of each other, you can see that they line up pretty well on these uh, terraces and on the floodplain on the right-hand side here. But in the channel itself, you can see that we've got quite a bit of uh, change happening. So that's the 2011 and that's the 2008 turned on. And so you can see we've had quite a bit of erosion uh, from the 2008, but also some deposition. And so this is really what we're after with any kind of change detection is to, to really look at um, the change across our data set. Um, so keeping this cross section in mind, um, let's look at how uh, so kind of point cloud differencing and raster differencing, which most of us are used to in a GIS program, are a little bit different. So here we've got uh, two cross sections of a point cloud. So we've got time one in blue and time two in red. And so the we're, first we're going to look at kind of a traditional raster based way of doing this. And in a simple case like this, a raster based way is potentially uh, fine. But we'll look at a more complicated example uh, next that where raster-based uh, change detection might not work so well. So if we were going to rasterize, quote unquote, rasterize this data, uh, first of all, we'd take these point clouds and we'd kind of run a surface through them. So those are those lines there. And so we'd end up with kind of a, a, a little bit more of a simplified landscape than our original point cloud. And then we'd um, cut this up into discrete pixels um, using kind of a, a, a uniform pixel size. And so if we do this in cross-section view, what it would look like is kind of a stepped uh, look like this. So we take that, that, that kind of generic surface that we got from our point cloud and turn it into kind of a stepped profile like this. So each one of those kind of step treads is a pixel in our raster data set. And so in, like I said, in a simple situation like this, where we have a fairly, you know, low gradient, low relief area, um, you know, raster based change detection like this works just fine. So if we converted our point cloud to a raster data set and basically difference those two, so it took time one minus time two, you know, we could look at this in terms of change. So we'd see in the middle of our cross section here, we see a kind of an erosion, so a decrease in the elevation, and then on the right side there, an increase in elevation. So again, this is just to, to illustrate um, the, the kind of the idea here. So in a simple situation like this, a raster-based approach might be uh, just fine, but um, there's quite a few cases uh, in uh, the point cloud world where this simple type of raster-based change detection doesn't actually capture all of the change that's happening in a data set. And so if we look at a more complex example, so this is something with very, very steep uh, uh, slopes or, or high gradients. Um, and in some situations, we may even have places where we have kind of undercuts. So we actually would have a situation where instead of just going straight up like this, we could actually have an undercut in here. So again, if, we, if we're thinking about this in a river context, that might be a cut bank that's been undercut. Or on a hill slope, um, that could be an area where we had a landslide. Anyway, so this is just a more complex kind of example of a, um, a, 
a change detection scenario. So in this case, we have time one in green and time two in orange. And so if we go through that same kind of progression of developing a surface and rasterizing that surface, what we can see from a raster perspective, once we start to get into kind of high relief or, or lots of kind of vertical surfaces, is that our raster data set doesn't really capture a lot of the detail and a lot of the, the real change that's happening in this data set. And so we've got an alternative way to do change detection, um, which again, doesn't use raster based, a raster based approach. It uses a, what's called a point cloud normal based approach. And so to kind of really illustrate um, what we're talking about in terms of normals, we're talking about surface normals. And so this is kind of a concept from uh, linear algebra. And so a surface normal is basically which direction the surface is facing. So it gives us some information about the kind of the orientation of a surface. And so if we look at a kind of generic surface like this, so where gray is kind of the ground surface and the, the white above it is kind of the air or sky. Um, if we look just over on the left side of our uh, example here, you can see that this is a kind of a flat surface. And if we were gonna map the normal of that surface, it, it's a normal is just a perpendicular kind of arrow illustrating the direction that that surface is pointing. So if we look at that flat surface and we draw a perpendicular arrow there, that would be the, the quote unquote normal of that surface. So that's the direction that that surface is oriented. So if we extend this across our entire uh, kind of illustration surface here, what you can see is that if we map all of the normals here, we would get positive values kind of in uh, and a kind of a perpendicular uh, orientation to our surface. So in the flat areas, we're pointing straight up, but once we get into these, some of these curved areas, you can start to see that we get some normals that are starting to kind of point out away from the, the surface at kind of, I don't know, some weird angles, but those are in perpendicular uh, fashion to the, to the surface itself. And so once we've mapped these normals, we can actually do change detection kind of along that perpendicular surface rather than just looking at it in a truly vertical sense like we do with raster data. And so in the kind of the normal world, um, we can have positive normals like this. This is the, the, the direction that the, the surface is facing. But when we do change detection along that perpendicular axis, we can actually get positive or negative values based on which direction that surface is moving from between our kind of time one data set and our time two data set. And so if you look at those surfaces again from our more complex surfaces, so if we were to actually do change detection in this case, we're actually gonna do change detection along the kind of the normal axes of the green surface. And so we'd actually be mapping surface change kind of in the kind of orientation of that original surface. And so think about this as kind of a landslide feature potentially. And so our green surface here, and then we're actually gonna detect change and kind of the distance between the green surface and the orange surface along that kind of normal. And so we're actually measuring change, not just in a vertical sense, like we would in the raster, but we're actually measuring kind of into the slope. And then same thing down here on the bottom, we're actually measuring from that, uh, that green surface up to our orange surface in a kind of perpendicular fashion. And so this gives us a kind of a different and a little bit more accurate way to do change detection in complex point cloud uh, surfaces. And so I've put up the citation there, which is kind of one of the primary uh, pieces of literature on uh, how to do this. Um, and it's the tool that we're gonna actually use in Cloud Compare to uh, do our point cloud change detection next. Okay, so let's jump back into Cloud Compare. And 
One thing that we're not going to do today specifically is talk in a lot of detail about um, error propagation and how to do kind of the effective uh, way of doing um, kind of some of the change detection statistics related to limits of detection and that sort of thing. Um, so if you're interested in this further, I encourage you to go look up uh, some literature on limits of detection in kind of the, the geomorphic change detection literature. Um, so today we're just going to go through the, the basics of the, the tool that does our normal based um, change detection. So I've got these two data sets. So I've got a, the 2008 data set and the 2011 data set. Um, kind of the, what I've got ahead and done is just clip this out and then stripped it down to just the ground surface. So the, the classification of two. Um, so here you can see kind of the, the hill slopes and uh, the, the river channel down at the bottom. And actually, if I turn on, there's a way to do some kind of pseudo hill shading in Cloud Compare if you're interested. And so the, um, the tool here is what's called iDome Lighting. Um, and so that's on my toolbar, it's up here on the upper right, uh, but it's a little button that says EDL. Um, and so if you click on that button, you'll get kind of a kind of a bit of a hill shade effect on your point cloud. Um, now it's not huge, but um, it's enough to kind of highlight some of the uh, the kind of edges and, and things like that. And so the other the other way that you can in, enhance this effect is if you kind of increase your point size a little bit to kind of merge together some of those points. And so if we rotate this around, you can start to see there's some a little bit of shadowing here to kind of increase some of the, the definition uh, in our landscape here. And so if we look at um, the, the two data sets here, so this is the 2011, and if I go to the 2008, um, up on the hill slopes, you don't see a lot of change per se, but down in the river channel, as we saw in that cross section, uh, example, you see quite a bit of change. So flipping between those two, you see that there's quite a bit of change there. And so that's really what we're after uh, in measuring uh, our change detection here. So the way that we're going to do this uh, change detection is by selecting the two point clouds that we want to compare. So I'm going to click on the 2008 and then press and hold the shift key on my keyboard and then select the 2011 data set. So both of those are selected. And then over here on uh, my toolbar, again, yours may be in a different spot, but is this tool called M3C2, which is the multi-scale model to model cloud comparison. Um, and so this is the tool that was developed out of that, uh, that article that I had on the last uh, slide there. And this tool is pretty powerful and it's built right into Cloud Compare, which is pretty handy. So if you open up this tool, um, you'll see that there's a lot of options to go through and we're just gonna go through kind of the really basic options uh, in this case. Um, and so the first, uh, place to look is to make sure that your two clouds are in the right spot. And so cloud one is usually our time one. And so that's our 2008 data set. And then cloud two is our time two data set. And that's our 2011 data set. Um, if you selected those in a different order, uh, they may come in at a different order. And so over here on the right hand side, there's a flip button. And so you can flip those if they're not in the right uh, position. So without getting into too much of the details of what's going on in here. Um, basically, the, the scales uh, window right here is how we're gonna calculate our normal direction, and then how we're going to actually do what's called the projection uh, in this method, which is like how big of an area are we gonna look for change uh, on the point cloud. And so our point cloud is in meters, so this is all in meters. Um, and the other uh, option here is the max depth, so how deep um, within the point cloud it should be looking. 
And then the other options down here are the, what are called the core points. So this is how we're gonna calculate our normals and do our change detection. And so normally um, you can either subsample your first point cloud uh, to a uniform spacing, or you can use the point cloud on its own. Um, now there's positives and negatives to both of these. Uh, but for this example, we're just going to go with use cloud one. And then if you knew the registration error, so the georeferencing error between those two data sets, you could actually put that in, you could select this box and put that in um, as a kind of a metric number. And that helps with the, uh, what's called the significance um, calculations at the end. But for now, for this example, we're not going to include that. So the... First question is, um, how do we come up with the normal diameter, the projection diameter, and the max depth? Now, it Cloud Compare and the M3C tool, two tool uh, calculate these automatically, uh, pretty much when you load them up. There is this button called Guess Parameters down here, and that goes through and does kind of a rough uh, guess at um, which scale the normal should be at and which scale the projection should be at. And so if you click on this multiple times, oftentimes you'll get multiple answers. Um, as you'll see, as I'm kind of clicking this button, you can see that this is changing. And generally speaking, you can edit these uh, if you know what you're doing. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can use the guess parameters to get close. Um, and then we can, uh, if the change doesn't look right at the end, you can come back and, re and redo this. The calculations are actually fairly quick. Um, so for this example, I'm just going to kind of leave it uh, where it kind of came in originally at, at 7.7 .7 and 15. Um, you can click through these other tabs. Um, if, again, you're going to need to know what you're doing to change these, but the calculation mode, we're going to leave it default. Um, the orient, the preferred orientation here is in the Z direction, the vertical direction. Um, advanced uh, options here, again, I encourage you to read through the paper and read through the documentation to figure out if you need those or not, or what those are actually doing. Um, the precision maps, and this is something that's uh, specific to structure for motion and photogrammetric data sets is um, that you can actually input a, um, what's, what um, it's called a, a 3D uncertainty-based topographic change detection parameters uh, from this article by uh, James Robson and Smith. Um, and that takes uh, quite a bit of effort to do. Um, so that's uh, not something we're gonna do for this specific LiDAR data set, but um, I encourage you to, to read through that uh, potentially for uh, other uh, more accurate structure for motion change detections. Uh, but again, for this data set and for um, most things, you can uh, skip over this uh, for now. And then uh, the last kind of important outputs here are, or the last important uh, options are the outputs. And so, here, we're going to use the default, which is project core points on cloud two. So this is going to basically project the cloud one point onto the cloud two points. And we're going to end up with the, in our case, the 2011 data set with the change detection numbers on it. Um, the other options here, export standard deviation information and point density. Those are optional. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to add those, but they can be interesting in certain situations. So once we've got this set up, we can go ahead and hit OK. And this will go through and calculate that change detection math for you. Um, now, on a bigger data set, that will definitely take longer than it did uh, for this smaller data set. Um, this is only about 150,000 points each, about 200, 150 to 200,000 points. So this is actually goes fairly quickly. Um, for higher resolution data sets and especially data sets that have a smaller projection and smaller normal calculations, those will, that calculation will take uh, a little bit more time. So what we end up with in our DB tree over here is a new point cloud, uh, which is called M3C2 output. And then it gives you the scale at which it was calculated. So this was that 7.7 .7 for the, the normal scale. So 
if we scroll down in our properties down here, okay, you can see that we've got our histogram of, this is essentially measuring the total change in our uh, data set here. And the default color ramp right here is not very good for change detection by default. Um, the one thing that uh, M3C2 does automatically is that it does, it automatically is selected as a symmetrical color scale. So it's gonna center at zero. Uh, which is good, so you don't have to worry about that. But the thing we want do want to change up here is the color ramp. And so what we're looking for in a color ramp here is usually for change detection is a divergent color ramp. And so there aren't that many built into Cloud Compare uh, by default. Um, I've got a whole series of these on uh, my GitHub, and I'll put a link down in the description of this video. Um, to all of these kind of custom color ramps that I've created that you can just import uh, directly. Um, so I'll go ahead and show you how to import those real quick is if in your color scale uh, kind of portion of your properties here, if you hit the little gear icon over on the left here, that brings up the color scale editor. And if you download a custom color ramp from say my GitHub or anybody else's uh, online kind of uh, color ramps, specifically for Cloud Compare, um, you can import a color scale from a file with the, the little folder icon here and go find the, it's an XML uh, document that you downloaded, hit open, and that'll pop in that new color ramp um, here. You can also use the color scale editor here, editor here to create a new color ramp and define your own color ramp if you'd like as well and save that uh, directly for your local Cloud Compare uh, use. So in my case, I'm gonna use one uh, that's a little bit garish, uh, but is actually really good for change detection, is um, a one that I've created, it's called Purple White to Red, and it's a divergent color ramp. And so basically what this color ramp is, if I turn on our color bar here, is that we have zero as white, and then I've got, um, in this case, erosion as greens, blues, and purples, and then deposition as yellows and reds and oranges. Um, now, that I'm potentially gonna make a, a flipped version of this as well. Um, I've had some interesting uh, discussions with colleagues about is red erosion or is blue erosion or either vice versa. Um, so in this case, we're gonna look at kind of the, the cooler colors as erosion and the warmer colors as deposition, uh, just for this example. Uh, if you don't like that color ramp, you can switch it or use a different one. Um, but the nice thing about this style of color ramp is that we actually have multiple colors for each um, positive and negative change in our case. So in our case, the, the warmer colors are positive changes and the cooler colors are negative changes. Um, and by default, there gonna be, there's going to be some uh, parts of the change detection that are kind of way off the end. So in this case, the max change that we've seen in this data set is somewhere around 16 meters. And I'm not sure exactly where that, it's probably one or two points uh, that have uh, registered that much change, but that's not totally real uh, in this sense. So that's something to investigate uh, in your own data set. But what I am going to do is go ahead and change our um, our saturation value here to about three meters. Uh, so from zero to three is going to give us kind of the, the darkest reds and the purples are going to be plus or minus three meters. And so in this case, what you can see once we do that is that we get a really nice kind of picture of the change in this uh, river section. And so in this case, the, again, the cooler colors, the purples and the blues and the greens are all erosion okay, of different varying amounts. And then yellows and reds and oranges are areas of deposition. And so if we start on, this is the upstream end over here where my cursor is. So you can see there's actually a little bit of deposition here, which would indicate there's kind of a medial bar forming in this river, but then erosion along kind of the bank and this bank um, 
kind of all the way down uh, through what's the former reservoir um, above uh, Marmot Dam here on the Sandy River. And so generally what we can say about something like this, in this case, is that this is pretty uniform um, erosion through this section. And so that would indicate that the, the former bed of the reservoir and now the bed of the, the, the channel bed is lowering down kind of as a whole here and by varying amounts. So upwards of three meters in some cases on these uh, upstream banks here, but down through the middle here, lower amounts. And so one thing we can do to check individual values is use our point picking tool up here. So our individual point picking tool and we can actually click on some areas in here and actually get the actual M3C2 distance for any given point. Uh, so in this case, that's minus 75 centimeters uh, on the green into the blue. We're talking about minus two meters. Um, and then on this bar upstream bar here, we're seeing deposition around 84 centimeters, 85 centimeters. So not insignificant change in uh, this river channel. Now, if we turn off our point picking tool so we can rotate around a little bit, and we can actually rotate this around and start to uh, look at some of the other changes uh, that we see. And so one thing that um, the M3C2 does is that it automatically turns on the normal projections that it calculated. And so one thing you usually want to do is turn off the eye dome lighting since that kind of makes it a little bit too dark. But the normals that are uh, displayed you know, on our M3C2 give it that hill shaded effect um, kind of by default. So if we rotate this around, you can kind of see some highlights and shadows here. If that's a little too annoying and a little too uh, kind of harsh or dark for you in your properties window over here, there's the normals uh, option checkbox here. You can turn that on and off as you see fit. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and leave it on for now. Um, so in Visualizing this uh, change along here, you can start to see that, um, you know, there's some pretty good patterns of erosion and deposition here. Um, and if you were interested in the geomorphic change detection of the river, you could do some, some further analysis here. Um, the only thing that I want to show you kind of lastly is the other kind of outputs from the M3C2. Um, so if you go in your properties window down to the scalar fields, you can see that the active one here is M3C2 distance. So that's the, the change amount between the two data sets. But if you switch this um, into this uh, options menu, you can see that there's uh, two other uh, scalar fields put on here by default. One is called significant change and the other is distance uncertainty. And so significant change is either kind of a one or a zero for kind of significant or insignificant change. And that's, uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that. So I definitely encourage you to read through the documentation and the academic article on that to figure out how they're calculating significant change. But one of the, the uh, factors that goes into the significant change is the distance uncertainty. So how much kind of uncertainty is there between the two the two point clouds. So that has a lot to do with point cloud roughness or what we call the standard deviation of elevation. Um, but so in this case, if we click on the significant change, you can see here that red is significant and gray is not significant. Um, and so most of our channel is bright red, which is good. That's significant change. Uh, the one thing that you will see in this data set and oftentimes you will see this in other data sets too, is that there's a smattering of quote unquote significant change up here in the hill slope where we're not really expecting a lot of change. Um, and so part of this is due to kind of the noisiness of the point cloud up here, so the bumpiness of it. Um, part of it is based on some of the options that we selected, so the, the normal projection and or the normal uh, scale and the projection scale all kind of factor into this. So that's, there's some trial and error in this def especially um, if you really do want to look at kind of significant versus non-significant change in your data set. Um, so you might want to play around with that a little bit to see if you can get um, 
just the areas that are significant to pop out and the kind of areas that you think are non-significant to kind of fade into the background. And you're going to need to do some kind of extra work on that and some field validation potentially. Uh, so don't don't go, go do that willy-nilly, but um, changing up some of the parameters in the tool can get you some, some better results here. And then the last uh, part here is that distance uncertainty measurement. And so in this case, most of them have, are in the blue range down here, so fairly low uncertainty, but there's some points here you can see have higher uncertainty values. Um, and you can change the, the saturation on your color ramp here if you wanna see some of the, the differences. And so really it's steeper areas along some of the banks have higher uncertainty, and then in areas where we have more noise in our point cloud, we have higher uncertainty. And so some of that, again, that's a kind of a key factor in the, um, the significant change calculations as well. So that's the basic rundown for M3C2 uh, change detection. Um, again, I encourage you to go read that article. And um, there's also some documentation about the tool on the Cloud Compare Wiki site as well. Um, and I'll try to link to both of those down in the description as well if you're interested. So uh, with that, have fun doing some change detection and we'll catch you in the next one.